Okay. Okay. All right, everybody. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry for the link. Uh, uh, I'm Mike McBride. I'm Mike McBride. Uh, 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 our present presenter is uh, Paolo de Paolo Prado. Prado. Uh, is uh, a software engineer background, PhD in machine learning. Uh, his work, his work is a time to Mike's project consultant in cybersecurity domain. He's currently working on privacy, privacy, machine learning, and cyber machine learning. 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 Cyber Uh, hi uh, to everyone virtually. I'm basically uh, speaking from uh, Cambridge, not in MA, but uh, from the UK. So there's a bit of a time difference. Oh, is there an echo there? Oh gosh, okay. Let's see if we can get. Let's see if I can get my uh, <laughs> headphones. Is it better now? Better. Okay. Okay. So um yeah, no echo, no echo, all good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm basically um currently, yeah, as I say that I work as a senior data scientist uh from Fortinet. Uh and um yeah, my my a main area of research besides uh insurance, uh it's basically differential privacy uh and machine learning. So um Just a little disclaimer, <laughs> uh, you know, I've done this research on my own. So uh, my employer, which is Fortinet currently, is not involved uh, and obviously doesn't reflect on uh, any any of <laughs> their views. Uh, I don't work for any insurance provider, um, so I'm sort of impartial to, uh, to this specific topic. Uh, but I do mentor a startup that does uh, risk insurance analytics for, uh, for cyber insurance purposes. And this is how I basically got involved in the in this kind of uh, sector. So um, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting space, um, you know, from a technical perspective. And uh, yeah, this is why I got into it uh, on a on a part time basis. Let's say that. Uh, so the agenda for today is okay, we're going to be late, so it will be forty five minutes. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to start my timer just in case I get <laughs> uh, too slow. Um, uh, basically, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, our Uh, cyber insurance, um, how basically it was developed over time, uh, the uh, business driver for uh, for the actual insurance, um, kind of a little bit about the process that drives um, the kind of insurance market, technical challenges that um, we are facing, um, and you know a bit of stuff that we've seen in news, especially with the uh, pipeline ransomware attack and um, uh, stuff like that, right? Um, And then obviously ransomware and semi insurance, which is a kind of a very hot topic. Um, uh, the GDPR uh, and uh, cyber insurance, uh, which is, I guess, more for the European people, <laughs> but it's also relevant to US companies. Um, and basically, how the attack review, uh, you know, cyber insurance, uh, how they leverage that. And then a little bit of some predictions there. Uh, so I think. It's kind of probably most people know about cyber insurance, but it's like any other insurance, I guess. Um, um, it's basically a product that, you know, if you have a business, you can use to protect. Um, typically, it was developed for basically internet-based risk, but, you know, it, it doesn't have to be coming from the internet. Uh, but, yeah, you know, in general, just any anything related to information technology, um, infrastructure and activities. Um, There are, you know, like this kind of, you know, if you look at traditional insurance, those kind of liabilities are usually ex excluded from those products. So that's why you have to buy specifically several insurance. Um, there are essentially two type of coverage, broadly speaking, is the kind of first party uh, cyber um, coverage, which you can see in the uh, blue color there, you know, the dark color. Um, you know, you can read this later, but... You know, anything related to, uh, you know, business interruption uh, cost and, um, uh, you know, recovering from incidents, uh, rebuilding your backups, you know, restoring your backups, um, you know, cyber extortion recently uh, with ransomware, um, you know, notifications, uh, investigation for privacy, anything that basically um, it's related to the business, right, in terms of cost. Um For the third party coverage, it's related to uh, essentially regulation most of the time. 
uh, you know, media sort of reputation, essentially releasing statements and, um, you know, for, uh, you know, anything related to a uh, data breach, uh, you know, slander and uh, those kind of nice things. Uh, um, and, you know, privacy and so on. So that's, that's the kind of two main sort of, um, uh, you know, sections that you have to look when you buy cyber insurance, you know, what does it cover uh, in terms of third party and uh, third party insurance? Um, in terms of uh, maturity, like most people think, you know, cyber insurance is new, but actually, uh, you know, we can track it back to the 90s. Uh, you know, originally it was mostly to cover, uh, uh, you know, like um, essentially, essentially random errors and omissions. Uh, yeah, so the main buyers were like professional service firms and technology. Um, you know, in the early thousands, the coverage was for breaches, but uh, no first party coverage uh, and a lot of exclusions. So, it, you know, it was kind of uh, new, I guess. It was the kind of, you know, sort of uh, inception of uh, like, you know, modern cyber insurance. Uh, and main buyers were basically healthcare and retail. Um, uh, and yeah, the uptake was kind of slow. And then, you know, we move a little bit to the, uh, you know, mid 2000s. Um, coverage was added for first party, including business interruption, extortions, uh, and network asset damage. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was essentially coverage for privacy online and offline. And more sort of people were buying that, more customers were buying that, you know, retail, healthcare, and finance, uh, financial institutions, um, which, you know, guess what? We're including some significant uh, personal information. Uh, and then, you know, uh, there was, uh, you know, if uh, compliance uh, kicked in uh, and then so they had to add that too. Uh, but currently you can pretty much have uh, cyber insurance for um, almost any kind of uh, uh, first party and third party um, coverage. So there is basically you can have a full coverage. What? Well, uh, in theory, you can have a full coverage uh, for almost everything, but uh, we will see why that's not always the case. Um, and in terms of main buyers, well, there is basically almost every every industry now is buying it from manufacturers to energy and transportation, including the, uh, the previous ones. Um, and like, you know, why this why this uptake? Well, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, kind of uh, in terms of commercial activities, like, you know, the first one that was available was in the nineteen ninety eight from uh, ICSA through Secure. Uh, they had a um, you know a first party coverage of twenty thousand dollars per incident. Uh, and the maximum two hundred fifty thousand per year. Uh, you know, uh, I guess if you factor in for inflation, it's it's much more nowadays. But you know, if you look at you know over time, uh, you know up to uh, you know two thousand with AIG, you can get you know first and third party coverage for twenty five millions now. So, so you know, it's basically uh, it's it's I guess with any other type of other insurance uh, markets, you know, like. There's a growing need to uh, to satisfy, and uh, you know the kind of coverage uh, has increased over time. And it's kind of interesting when you look at these companies. I guess I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, how they uh, sort of partnered with each other. Uh, you know, in 1998 there was Cisco Systems, and um, you know a few other companies that were basically selling some sort of uh, insurance, which uh, was kind of interesting. And you know, some of the companies, I don't know if they're still in business, like the. Vert scale underwriting. Uh, I don't know if they changed to uh, some other sort of branding uh, brand or, but uh, you know, IBM was the other one that was um, yeah kind of a pioneer of cyber insurance. You know, nineteen ninety eight, we were already selling that, so it's kind of interesting to see that. Uh, but you know, if you look at the kind of uptake of cyber insurance, is very much correlated from uh, what we have seen in terms of internet worms, right? So in the two thousand, there is the Alloview. Uh, with an estimated cost worldwide of uh, fifteen billion dollars, then there was Codred in two thousand one, uh, Nimda, Clads. You know how many people remember that? There was the Slammer War, uh, and then you know fast forward, uh, you know sorry, My Doom, um, Stormworm, Configure, uh, Stuxnet, uh, which wasn't really, um, you know, designed to disrupt uh, those uh, general public, but you know we know we were. Was targeted for uh, it was targeted for uh, Iranian enrichment plans, but you know the, it was infecting a lot of uh, a lot of endpoints. Uh, and then to the recent one, you know, like WannaCry, NotPetya. I think everybody knows about those two um, 
uh, worms, you know, with four billion, ten billions of uh, damages in total. So, uh, so yeah. So the main driver is obviously the uh, the uh, cybercrime, right? So like how uh, the internet has developed and uh, basically facilitating all these kind of um, you know threat vectors, right? That we have seen. Uh, and uh, you know, I was a contractor in two thousand. Before that, you know, I was uh, doing uh, basically like a, just partner part time consulting for. Uh, Recovering from uh, worms and viruses, and I do remember the the, the Alobu incident, uh, which was kind of uh, kind of interesting at the time, right? It was probably one of the major ones, and um, you know, it was quite simple if you think about it now. But uh, at the time, it was uh, new, and everybody was uh, you know caught off guard by that. So, um, uh, so there will be more in the future, I, I'm guessing, right? So, uh, and the other, obviously, the other push of uh, you know, for the uptake of cyber insurance is obviously uh, regulation, right? So we, uh, you know, in 1986, there was the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the US. Uh, then there was the dot-com boom, you know, everybody was moving online. Uh, in 1996, there was the uh, HIPAA Act, uh, which it's quite incredible if you think about it nowadays, if you look, uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, in terms of uh, industry uh, verticals, it's probably... You know, the healthcare is the one that is uh, like one of the major t- uh, targets of uh, cybercrime. If you look at the Polymon reports or the uh, Verizon report from, you know, from a couple of years ago until now, uh, healthcare is, what you know, basically always on the top, right? So it was kind of interesting um, that people have already thought about that in 1996. So that was kind of a nice piece of le- legislation then. There was the... Uh, uh, GLBA Act um, in Europe, you know, a little bit slower, so we uh, we take some time to learn from from the US. But you know, there was a the Council of Cybercrime Treaty uh, in 2000, uh, 2002, the uh, Serpentis Oxley Act, um, and then there was the you know California state law. 2003, there was a kick about focusing on PII and cost. Um, that we know that there was the Presidential Directive 54. Uh, EO again was following with the NIS directive, and then you know if you fast forward now, we have basically GDPR from 2018, and 2020 we have the basically CCPA uh, came into force, which is basically kind of a, the equivalent European equivalent of uh, uh, of the GDPR. So you know obviously this is kind of uh, it's kind of a you know basically. Uh, when you look at liabilities and fines, uh, you, you know you do want to have some sort of coverage for that, and uh, which is also actually not a good thing. Uh, but we'll, I will talk about that later. Uh, so the business of cyber insurance, what, uh, how does that work, right? Um, you know, you have the insurer and the insured. Actually, it's more complicated than that. It's uh, uh, but I'm trying to s- simplify that. So, so the insurance. Um, wants to seek to capture profits from premiums uh, exceeding, uh, exceeding losses over time by basically spreading uh, risk uh, of you know certain uh, lo- uh, events that you know we can't really uh, predict accurately uh, that possibly are uncorrelated between clients right so you're basically kind of making a profit on uh, on the um, losses of your of, of your customers assuming that you can measure risk very well. And the insured, uh, the insured is basically uh, somebody that seeks to maximize their utility or profit by managing the risk uh, and certain loss events that they basically uh, offset to the insurer, right? So it's it's basically risk transfer. It's at the end of the day, it's basically transferring risk from one party to the other one. Um, and so, what's the game there, right? Like so, like um, you know, the the game there is basically to try to measure risk as accurately as you can uh, because if you set your premiums to high obviously we are in a free market at least in uh, most democratic uh, countries uh, which means if your premiums are too high somebody else will capture that profit their their margin right so they are going to basically um, you know uh, compete and all, uh, offer low uh, low premiums uh, basically stealing your customers uh, but on the other side, if you price your insurance, your premium is too low, um, and you have losses, you basically might go bankrupt, right? So, um, so it is, you know, it, it is kind of a challenge, and it's it's very much like an information uh, theory problem, right? It's uh, that's why you have a lot of uh, actuarial people trying to guess uh, risk and uh, basically measure that, right? And 
the most important metric from an insurance uh, perspective is the uh, combined ratio. So like obviously you have the premiums that brings cash in, uh, but then you also have your loss ratio. Uh, there are kind of various problems in the uh, cyber insurance uh, nowadays. Uh, you know, I, I would call these like minor issues. Uh, one is basically adversarial selection where there is an information asymmetry where basically, uh, you know, the cyber insurance needs to try to guess uh, the, let's say, matu maturity of, of a company, right? Because, uh, you know, you want to give uh, a low premium, like low coverage contract to, uh, to a company that is uh, probably uh, too risky or, or high premium, high coverage contract to, uh, to a company that is less risky, right? Um, and the problem is that obviously there are companies that try to pretend to be less risky, right? So they want to have a lower premium uh, and, Essentially, what happens with this kind of um, uh, within, within this problem is that you you tend to uh, to have what is called like a welfare loss, where essentially you have the smaller companies are probably un uh, are on average underinsured, and the the bigger companies uh, are you know have pretty good insurance uh, policy. So you sort of you know to reach the market equilibrium, you are basically penalizing the the smaller players. Um, there's nothing really uh, new about this. You know, this is uh, very common in other industries. Um, maybe it's going to be more in cyber insurance because, uh, you know, people don't know how to measure risk yet. But, you know, there are, there are a lot of tools and things that companies are doing to, uh, to measure that. Uh, there's a problem of moral hazard where basically, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when you have coverage, you are a little bit more, uh, let's say, relaxed. Uh, so you, you might basically click on any... any <laughs> <laughs> any spam link you get and uh, uh and uh, you know you're just relying on some insurance to uh or your insurance provider to basically fix uh whatever incidents you have uh but you know to solve that basically you know insurance providers are you know uh, pretty um pretty uh clever so they will put exclusions in place so that if for example um you had a let's say a, a breach or something they say well you know you don't have backups uh, you know, you clicked on a on a phishing link that was marked as fish from your, uh, I don't know, uh, AV. Uh, so you know, I'm not going to cover for uh, for that, right? Because you know, you didn't practice, um, uh, you know, very basic cyber hygiene procedure. So, uh, so it, so I mean, it is a problem, but <laughs> you have to be careful when you buy this stuff. Insurance, there are a lot of exclusions to uh, to provide for that. And then there's externalities, right? So there are obviously all the computers are connected. Uh, you know, if there's a power failure or a, or a telecom failure, like the communication failure, you know, you might be able unable to perform your uh, business functions. Uh, you know, if there was a Hurricane Katrina <laughs> destroys your power line, you know, the computers goes off and uh, you know backup power only lasts for a few hours. Uh, so all those things, typically you will cover that with another uh, insurance policy, right? Because you can't factor in all these possible um, situations, right? Uh, but there are also things like act of cyber war that uh, was uh, unfortunately uh, uh, meant, well, this actually happened uh, in, a, in a specific case where you can basically say, well, you know, this was uh, impossible to predict. It was very sophisticated, so we don't cover for that. Um, so major issues are like what? You know, it's basically uh, uh, like one of the four pain points that we have nowadays, uh, risk prediction. Um, and I put some quotes there, but, you know, in other, seg you know, in other cyber insurance, uh, so in other insurance uh, sectors, you can basically have a pretty much good idea of, um, you know, like uh, when, when a building is going to burn down uh, in Manhattan or uh, there's going to be a hurricane or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's very hard to guess, uh, you know, if a specific customer will be back tomorrow. Um, there is data collection. So, you know, if you get policies for personal car or homeowners insurance, you, you know, you definitely have a lot of good data, but in, in cyber insurance, there's pretty much nothing, right? That um, it's disclosed publicly. Um, you have catastrophic modeling. So basically, um, you know, what is going to, uh, well, is there going to be a uh, next patia or a wanna cry and how much is going to be uh, big and, uh, you know, how many companies or, uh, you know, sectors is going to affect. And last but not least, uh, forensic analysis. Um, 
yeah, so there's not really a standard from the insurance side to basically follow a specific protocol uh, for basically doing forensic analysis and reporting of, of an incident, right? So so each contractor will do will follow a different process. Maybe they will follow the NIST 863, um, you know, framework or anything like that. But there's no really like a manual of, of standardized procedures to provide uh, analysis to um, to insurance. Uh, and also like, you know, customers, if they're malicious, they may also pretend to be hacked, um, you know, to um, to cash in some some money. And so, how do you you know how do you know that um, that that breach was uh, you know was a, a result of uh, collusion with with the uh, you know with another company or you know uh, cyber criminal, right? So yeah, it's very hard to uh, you know very hard to tell that, right? You know, like uh, obviously it shouldn't really often uh, happen really often, but uh, but it is a possibility that uh, you know. Nobody's really addressing today. Uh, so if we talk, if we look at the kind of um, you know profitability and loss ratios for uh, for cyber insurance, uh, this was basically um, this is coming from uh, from market update from uh, Aon, um, you know up to twenty twenty, um, and you can see that essentially, like in terms of losses uh, from two thousand five uh, to the 2015 to 2019, where you know uh, it was basically the uh, <laughs> year ransomware. Uh, you know, it didn't really impact them uh, pretty much. Uh, so it's sort of overing between you know like 50 percent to like you know 47 percent, right? Um, but you know there was an increase between 2018 and 2019. You can see that in those bars. Um, and like what was different was, as you can see in the text, that it was more like a jump in frequency, right? Um, uh, rather than the sort of uh, claim size, right? Because you know, there's two things that drives these losses: is like how many claims do you get, but what's the kind of value of each claim, right? Um, and yes, you can you can look at this later, but uh, but yeah, so like you know, like you are thinking. Uh, well, what's what's forty seven percent? Like, is it a good number for them? Uh, you know, how does it compare to, uh, you know, to other to other industries, right? So, uh, just to give you an idea, you know, like in property, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of frequent to have a, a one billion loss per event. Uh, so, if you look at US and Canada from two thousand eight uh, until now, pretty much there were like fifty seven big events like that, right? So. And Hurricane Katrina, uh, which was the biggest global uh, insurance loss in history, was one hundred sixty billion dollars, right? So, so that's the kind of size we are talking from, from like a physical, uh, physical insurance, you know, type of insurance. Um, but you know, if you look at Patia or not Patia, uh, the estimated loss in two thousand seventeen was three billions, right? Um, the American Co. Uh, that was the pharmaceutical company. At a 1.75 billion cyber loss and 250 million affirmative losses, uh, so you know if you look at those two, it's uh, it, you know relatively speaking, it's not that big, right, uh, compared to other insurance market. And uh, you know if you look at WannaCry, uh, the estimated losses were you know sort of four billion. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know in the UK, WannaCry costed our uh, you know national uh, national health. Um, a system about ninety four million, so you know they're kind of small. You know they're, you know they're not that big. Uh, and then so like, but uh, you know, okay, so you know, I give you those numbers, but you know, you, you have to consider the kind of combined loss, right? So if you look at that, uh, and if you want to choose like um, an insurance sector, uh, you definitely don't want to be in private car insurance. Uh, you can see there for two thousand nineteen. The combined loss was like ninety eight point eighty percent, right? So <laughs> that's quite high. Um, you know, home insurance ninety seven percent, private life insurance ninety seven percent as well, very similar to home insurance. Uh, property and casualty combined, it's ninety eight percent. So we, we, even when you factor in the kind of total uh, expense ratio for for cyber insurance, right? You are still Pretty much in a you know maybe ten percent lower than the other sectors, right? You know you're basically seventy four percent you know for uh, for two thousand nineteen compared to all these other sectors. So 
so it's pretty good, yeah. So it's pretty good profit for them, right? So so everybody's into uh, cyber insurance. Is the you know if you uh, you know if you want to go in insurance, go to cyber insurance. It's where you make most of your money now. Um, but w- one of the biggest problems with with basically ransomware, uh, you know, s- since uh, you know basically two thousand fifteen, but up to now, is that. Uh, essentially, <laughs> uh, the insurance providers are financing cyber criminals, right? Um, uh, and because of that, obviously, the uh, the insurance market is <laughs> more for a business has increased rapidly, right? So, uh, so you know, like according to these stats, basically the uh, the, the premiums uh, increase basically doubled to uh, three point one billions, right? Um, and Fortunately, there are a lot of companies that, even though they had, um, they try not to pay ransom, were instructed by the cyber insurance provider to do so. And the reason is kind of very ob- well, obvious. Uh, uh, you know, if the cost of the ransom, uh, of the actual ransom is lo- uh, is less than the actual cost of recovery, uh, then the insurance provider will say, "Well, you know what? Let's pay that, right? Because it will take you." You know, longer time to recover your business. We are going to pay all your business interruption costs. You have to get forensic involved. You have to get you know all those kind of other uh, professionals to uh, to be able to you know eradicate and basically uh, you know, re- restore your business. Let's just pay the ransom. Like that's the kind of most logical uh, decision there, right? Um, and uh, well, you know, as 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 you can guess, this is not well. This creates a positive feedback where basically. Uh, ransomware criminals, cyber criminals get more money and they can basically get more sophisticated and and do more of that, right? And if you look at the average ransom payment for, for from companies like Coverware, uh, you know it's about thirty six thousand um, dollars in the last uh, report, uh, and you know it, it basically went up six times from from the last uh, from last October. So uh, so yeah, so you know insurance companies are approving. Uh, ransomware payments, so uh, and there's a lot of ev- evidence of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, like uh, ransomware attacks, they are quite common now. So you know, as a result of that, 2019, uh, you know, like losses were spread across companies of all sizes, uh, especially the commercial segment. And uh, yeah, as I say, they were still making. Despite of that, uh, insurance companies were still making quite quite good money uh, up to 2019. Um, in the first half of 2020, so like last year, uh, you know, basic ransom attacks accounted for 41 percent of the total number of uh, cyber insurance claims. So so that's kind of a lot. And you know, if you want to do some cheap statistics, you can basically say that a business uh, would fall victim of a ransom attack every 14 seconds. Uh, and, um, yeah, so this is basically where the kind of insurance, uh, companies realize that, uh, uh, I guess, <laughs> uh, there could be, you know, like it's, it's good for business, but obviously, you know, it comes to a point where it's not sustainable anymore. Right. So, uh, so, you know, they were basically kind of predicting that, well, 2020 this is going to get worse. So we have to do something about that. Right. So, uh, we can just keep paying that, but uh, but uh, we'll see, uh, you know, what kind of things they're trying to do to, uh, to mitigate that. So, um, so like, you know, like, what do you do? Like, do you pay or not pay a ransom? Like, you know, it's, <laughs> to me, it's kind of an obvious, obvious decision. Like, uh, okay, if you pay the ransom, you can have a fast recu- recovery time, assuming you have a, uh, sorry, yeah, if you don't pay the ransom, but you have a good uh, incident response plan, obviously, Maybe you can go back with a couple of days, but uh, you know if you pay that, obviously you're going to find your criminals. You have going to have increased premiums, and you're also going to incur in loss of reputation, right? So, um, and there was a kind of an interesting story story from my own uh, country where um, uh, in Italy, like between the seventies and eighties, um, there were you know people were being kidnapped uh, for economical reasons, so. They were kidnap people and ask for a ransom. Um, you know, worst year was the seven, uh, 1977, where there were 70 uh, people. And, you know, they were in three key regions uh, where these kind of criminals were um, performing these kind of, uh, uh, you know, activities. And they were not just mafia, right? You would think that's probably just, uh, you know, the usual mafia doing that. But they were like people, you know, groups 
forum specifically for this kind of activity. So how did he stop, right? I mean, after a few years, like we didn't know anything about that. Um, so, you know, in the original penal code, please, no jokes, uh, the jail time originally was between eight and 15 years. Um, they had to put a new law, uh, you know, uh, 497, uh, 497, that increased uh, basically from, from 10, uh, you know, from eight to 15 to 10 to 20 years uh, in jail. And there were, you know, additional law that the government had to release specifically for that, right? So, you know, there was a additional penalties, uh, penalties if you were basically going to kill the person. Uh, and I, I, I think the most important law that was passed was in 1991, uh, which basically allowed the uh, police uh, um, or the basically law enforcement to actually stop payments, right? It didn't allow you to, you know, even if you had money, they would basically freeze your bank account. So you couldn't pay the actual criminals, right? But well, assuming the police became aware of that, right? Obviously, if you you know if you didn't do anything, then they couldn't stop that. Uh, so this is kind of a good lesson, right? Like that we can basically almost transfer to uh to uh, you know to uh, to ransomware, right? Uh, and well, the other problem is obviously you know I'm not against crypt- crypto, like I don't invest or trade in crypto, but like the, re- the main reason why criminals uh, are using these kind of strategies that it's very easy to to um, to basically get paid and uh, launder money uh, from crypto, right? Uh, so, so like you know, if you look at the kind of uh, you know percentage share of crypto payments uh, related to ransomware, okay, it's not that much, right? It's uh, you know before two thousand nine, before the kind of the two thousand nineteen was about you know, less than 1%, you know, it went up to 2% uh, and then it's going uh, back down in 2020. So people have stopped paying, uh, you know, ransomware. Uh, but, you know, it, it is it is basically the, uh, one of the main vectors to, to get paid, right? There's nothing, I mean, I never heard of a ransomware attack where like the uh, attacker said, put cash into a bank account or, uh, you know, bring a bag full of cash at this location, right? Um, it's it's very hard to do that because obviously law enforcement can track you, they can track your bank transaction. It's also very expensive to have an offshore company somewhere to basically move money quickly between between that. So uh, so it is you know like you know crypto is a factor uh, that allows cyber criminals to do that, right? So if there was no crypto, I don't believe we have we would see uh, we would see this kind of attacks, right? Um, and I mean, if you look at other, obviously other sort of, <laughs> uh, sources of income from, from cyber criminals, obviously scam is the, the largest share of, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, transactions. So, um, just checking my time. Yeah. Uh, in the colonial pipeline example, it was in the news, uh, 7 May, they got attacked, um, 8th of June, uh, basically <laughs> colonial pipeline, uh, pays dark side, um, we, I can't really tell if the insurance that they have, uh, which uh, is uh, the broker is Aon and is a mix of Lloyds of London, Axe and Beasley. Uh, they had a cover for the last 15 million. So the insurance could have paid for that, but we don't know, right? They didn't publish that kind of information. Uh, but funny enough, like basically after a few days, they, they paid. The FBI managed to get a subpoena for the, uh, for the crypto wallet where the uh, payment was received. And they managed to uh, to send back well money to another wallet. So um, so that was kind of interesting. Like the uh, I guess the criminals uh, were uh, sort of afraid of moving money from from that wallet. I don't really know why they took money outside of that wallet. So maybe it was a timing issue. I don't know. But in this case, obviously, you know, the client paid and the FBI managed to uh, to recover that. So um, uh, so that's kind of a kind of, kind of a first time. Like I, I never seen anything like that. So probably. One of the first uh, times uh, the FBI has stepped in to recover bitcoins uh, from from a ransomware payment. So um, so yeah, that was kind of an interesting one. And in terms of business impact, people think like, oh, this was like very complicated. But actually, what happened? They were basically um, uh, attacking their billing system that was went down, and because of that, they couldn't basically sell their their gas to to other to their customers. So. Um, so yeah, the billing system essentially blocked the actual, uh, uh, you know, t- transfer of, uh, of, of funds. Well, basically it didn't allow, uh, the company to conduct their business. So, so that, that was kind of an interesting, uh, twist. Uh, JBS, another example, the meat producer, they actually produce a quarter of the entire meat, uh, in the US, which is, which is scary. It's a Brazilian company. 
7 June, they got hacked. Uh, they had to shut down four factories, uh, four facilities. Uh, and on the 10th of June, that was a couple of days ago, they basically paid 11 millions um, to the, uh, you know, to the rival group, right? Um, I don't know what is going to happen. To, uh, the FBI, is it, are they going to try to do the same thing? Uh, maybe, I'm not sure. Like, maybe the uh, criminals are moving already. Um, I can't find any information about the cyber insurance, so I don't know like what kind of uh, insurance policy they have and if the insurance paid, but uh, but um, they did manage to restore from their backup. Uh, but uh, what they said was that despite their uh, you know IRP and uh, you know uh, pro, you know SOC and procedures and whatever, uh, it was still cheap. Well, it was still more effective to pay the criminals to get to get back in business quickly, right? even though they had procedures to restore that. Uh, although some something failed. Uh, so it wasn't clear maybe if they're bluffing, is this true or not, but they did they did pay and you know in this case we don't know if the insurance paid. Um this is quite good. Like, you know, the government now is stepping in to uh to basically kind of help uh you know at least the kind of central government or like well state level basically help uh you know local government to you know, fund their uh, security program. Uh, there was a, there was a bill from uh, uh, in the New York uh, State uh, Senate in 2020 uh, that will basically ban uh, local government to pay for ransom. But then they sort of block that. So, but anyway, something is happening, and um, uh, you know, like the uh, U.S. Treasury uh, had basically officially added these uh, crimeware gangs into sanction programs, uh, basically not allowing. Entities, entities or citizens doing business with them, like including uh, paying a ransom. So, and recently, President Biden, basically, there was the 12 May statement that basically say, well, you know, we should do our best to uh, uh, to to basically try to defend our uh, infrastructure, right? And uh, I mean, it wasn't anything specific, but uh, you know, there seems to be a willingness from the government to do that, which is a good thing. You know, this is basically copying, you know, like. The kind of same dynamic that happened in Italy for for the uh, for the ransomware uh, or, or for basically kidnaps of people. So it, it is a good it is a good way to step in. Uh, the other kind of interesting thing is that ransomware uh, needs to basically in terms of ransomware attack, like there's not really a clear regulation about what you should do in the US. Uh, you know, every every state, every jurisdiction have uh, some sort of data or breach notification law. There are some guidelines from FTC and uh, FINRA, but they don't really describe exactly what you have to do in case of a ransomware attack. So, uh, but the companies are quite good in doing that. They they are basically mentioning uh, in their annual reports and quarterly reports um, and you know special event filings uh, things around ransomware. Like it could be an attack, it could be like um, the special um, program they have against ransomware. Uh, so it's not just reporting attacks. It's just about anything related to ransomware. And there are like 8,220 8, documents basically mentioning ransomware. Um, um, so you can see that this kind of uh, trend has been increasing. So like, uh, you know, which is a positive thing it's from 2014, like there were people talking about ransomware, but obviously over time, uh, you know, it's basically increasing. Uh, there are all sorts of filings where you can search that. But the kind of most important thing is that um, from an attacker's perspective, is that you can actually even find out how much uh, a company has paid to restore for ransomware, right? So you can actually, you know, search this uh, sec repository and find out if if a company had a had an incident or like what kind of response plan they have for ransomware and you know how much it's going to cost and maybe even what insurance provider they're using for that. So what the attacker can do was, uh, you know, it's basically try to guess uh, how much. Um, ransom they should have so that they can be below the limit of the actual cost uh, that a cyber insurance co uh, coverage can provide. So they can basically kind of uh, adjust their, um, uh, you know, limits so that they can basically uh, be guaranteed to uh, to get paid. So, um, so you know, with every, every information disclosure, there is also kind of a risk of tipping off the attacker, which happens, uh, you know, in many, many ways. Um, there's also essentially, um, you know, uh, insurance companies have tried to do that. That was kind of cute. So AXA, uh, uh, with the French uh, company, uh, you know, it's one of the top five in, in, in Europe. They say, 9 of May, we are going to stop paying 
uh, ransomware, right? Like it was quite good. I, I love that. Then on the 19th of May, just 10 days after that, they got hit by a mass, massive ransomware attack, uh, which targeted most of the uh, APAC uh, regions, uh, which was quite bad. I don't know if it was kind of a timing, uh, you know, it really happened on purpose, but it was kind of scary. Um, you know, the Abdon ransomware was behind the attack and, um, you know, they saw all sorts of things, unfortunately. Uh, but historically, like, this is not new, like in, uh, you know, 2020, well, you know, recently, 21st of March, CNA was, was breached as well, uh, with CryptoLocker. Chubb allegedly was hit by Maze on 26 March 2020. Some legal firms doing sub-insurance by, by ransomware and, uh, you know, Aviva in 2009 as well. So, so the, so the risk is even like within the same insurance company. Uh, they have to be reinsured because, you know, they can get it by ransomware as well, right? So it's kind of an inception problem here. Like, uh, who is going to be that big to reinsure the insurance companies? And, you know, they're doing that, but it's kind of a risk in itself, right? So do you trust them with your data? So uh, it's sort of a problem. And, um, uh, and yeah, we can skip through these, but essentially, yes, uh, lots of things happen. Um, I think the most, scary uh, event in terms of payout was the, the pharmaceutical company uh, that they had a ransomware attack, they have cyber insurance coverage, but it was denied on the ground of act of terror. And I believe they're still in the litigation because the insurance company never paid. And it looked like it was an excuse to not to pay uh, the actual uh, the actual attack. So, um, so yeah. And uh, you know, no, no very, uh, not no very positive things. You know, when you know, if you have some insurance that doesn't pay off, uh, so, so it's not, uh, you know, it's not a good uh, form. And I think it might deter other companies to buy that. You know, like if all of these kind of examples, like you know, why do I buy some insurance if it doesn't cover me for things like that, right? So, uh, this is happening. You know, some insurance companies are basically trying to, uh, uh, try to uh, to limit their exposures uh, to ransomware. And what they're doing now is to add some limits so that if you have a ransomware attack, they will only pay you for a certain amount, like $25,000, for example, for ransom related costs. Uh, and, you know, they might add more exclusions, right? And, um, you know, as you can see, like, I mean, there is a trend, uh, in reducing payments, you know, in the last quarter of 2020. Um, and I think, you know, it could be two things. It could be because the insurance were not paying. Uh, it could be cyber maturity uh, and other things, but uh, but you have to be really careful when you buy cyber insurance. You really have to check all the details to make sure that uh, you know you have coverage for that. Because you know, uh, I think my fear is that you know before 2019 around that year, uh, the market was uh, you know the there was yeah, essentially cyber insurance was cheap, right? So the premiums were sort of um, you know essentially inflated. And now they're realizing like that they are actually, uh, you know, they were un they were basically incurring a lot of risk that they didn't know. So they're trying to, so the market is shrinking. And, you know, the insurance market is always that there are cycles, right? You know, there are periods where, uh, uh, you know, good profits, you know, uh, everybody's basically uh, under underinsured uh, and everything looks good. And then they realize, you know, with these things that, Perhaps, uh, you know, the premiums should be higher. And so, you know, there's a cycle and the kind of prices are going up. So this is, all, this is always happening. Uh, so my prediction is that um, and some people say, well, yeah, this thing is going to go up more, you know, like 265 billions by 2031 in 10 years. Um, I mean, it, it is possible, like we might get a surge uh, in, uh, you know, like we get, might get more of that. Um, and, you know, like, uh, you know, these kind of uh, predictions. Uh, but I think, you know, like if, if the government uh, put uh, regulation in place uh, and maybe crypto goes down, uh, I don't know what Elon Musk is going to do, but, you know, China put a ban on crypto exchanges and uh, coin offerings. Russia, I don't know, like most of the attacks, this kind of ransom will come from Russia. Uh, like, I don't know what they're going to do with that. Uh, but I think what we didn't see so much is the uh, DDoS type of uh, ransomware attacks where you basically, your company, uh, it's subject to a DDoS attack and the uh, cyber criminal basically ask you for ransomware to stop that. Uh, but there was uh, one event just recently, a couple of days ago, where basically Fancy Lazarus uh, ramped up um, DOS efforts for ransomware. So I think we're going to see more of that for sure. 
in terms of uh, damages from cyber uh, ransomware, if the government in US and Europe are basically putting all these uh, you know conditions in place, we are going to see less less of that for sure. Uh, there's another issue with GDPR. Like, uh, okay, it's not a big issue in the US, although if you have you, uh, you know European customers, you can do that. But the same issue applies to GDPR. Uh, so it's not illegal to have GDPR coverage, uh, liability coverage under cyber insurance, uh, which means that uh, it creates sort of a moral problem, right? Because uh, the entire point of uh, GDPR fines is that uh, you do want your uh, you do want that specific company to uh, to handle PII information accordingly, right? So to follow protocols and to be able to protect customers' data. But if all they do is to offset their risk to an insurance provider, then it's meaningless. This kind of legislation is useless, right? So um, and currently in the European Union, I read a lot of documents. It's not. It's kind of a gray area, uh, and most insurance providers do offer. It's a gray area, so it depends on the word. They do offer coverage for GDPR liabilities, right? Uh, and they did a small survey with uh, you know, uh, with 12 uh, CISOs. And unfortunately, most of them, they do use sub insurance to offset their uh, GDPR uh, uh, risk to, um, you know, uh, to basically, uh, uh, you know, not, well, I wouldn't say not to, to comply with GDPR, uh, but they don't do. They don't put too much, uh, much efforts in actually developing, let's say, a specific program, cybersecurity program to protect from uh, from a GDPR type of breach, right? From a privacy breach. Uh, and essentially, what they do is, from from their point of view, is that they want to protect the business, right? They don't really care about much. Well, at least most of them, they don't care about much their customers, sadly. Uh, but they mostly care about their business. So, what is more cost effective, right? So, should I spend you know, one million in developing a new program to uh, you know to protect uh, for privacy breaches, or do I pay I don't know hundred thousand per year to uh, you know uh, a premium from a sub insurance provider to be to be protected, right? So, so there's this kind of balance, and you know most CISOs unfortunately are seeing just the kind of cost risk analysis, uh, and they just do uh, their choices based on that. Uh, not all of them, uh, thankfully. But you also have to remember the, the average professional life of a CISO is, uh, you know, two basically two years. So um, uh, basically, they do their best to uh, to keep the business alive until they can. Uh, so unfortunately, that's the kind of uh, that's the that's the way business works, which is kind of sad. Um, there's a more general problem. Uh, it's adoption. Essentially, there's not much companies. Uh, buying cyber insurance, um, you know, if you look at the uh, overall U.S. budget, well, the U.S. Uh, new market, uh, you know, companies with more than 200 million uh, in basically protection uh, cover more than 20 percent of the uh, five billion market, right? So, if you have 250 companies uh, with, let's say, at least 200 million protection each, which is fairly reasonable, you just need five losses. Uh, to wipe out the entire premium, um, and so what's happening now in the market is that the insurers uh, then give fifty percent of their premium to reinsurers, right? Um, and that's the only way basically they have to protect themselves because you know if if another large scale uh, warm uh, happens, they basically go bust, right? Uh, and so they kind of sell their risk to to other reinsurers, um, which is pretty high. Like I don't know. How much is in other uh, sectors? I haven't find the specific numbers, but uh, I've been told fifty percent. It is quite high, uh, you know, compared to other uh, markets. So that's the way it works, sadly. Um, uh, sometimes it's just some uh, ransomware jokes, but um, in UK, actually, the uh, the cyber insurance market is smaller than the pet insurance market, which is uh, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, recently, uh, somebody. Um, Hacked uh, CD Project uh, Cyberpunk. Uh, I don't know how many people are playing that, but it's so full of bugs that I think uh, having <laughs> the actual source code leaked online, uh, it's actually a good thing. Maybe somebody is going to uh, go and, and fix the code. But uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is quite bad. And uh, Ashley Madison was breached again. So, well, not breached again, but basically, basically uh, running a new extortion scam 
from the previous customers from, from the previous attack. And uh, there was recently uh, also somebody stole the source code from uh, uh, from EA, which is another video game company. And um, you know maybe you can get some cheats from uh, from the source code. So uh, I mean, it's all sort of you know like it's not just like you know, healthcare and other uh, sectors like manufacturing that get targeted by even like, you know, uh, you know, game companies, like, uh, I guess uh, there's a lot of money in that and, you know, like dating websites, I guess. So, uh, so there is that. Um, uh, I just want to conclude with this slide where basically, um, you know, like insurance providers are making a lot of money, uh, well, at least from last year. And their main sources of income is underwriting. They, you know, investment income where they invest uh, the profits into uh, into the stock market. You know, cash value cancellations, coverage lapses, and reinsurance. Uh, but uh, what will be beneficial, uh, I guess, for for companies rather than just buying cyber insurance is essentially having them to finance, uh, you know, their cyber security program. Because if you have, um, if you have, especially for small companies where you know, like before they can actually buy seven insurance, like the risk is too high that like you, you buy uh, you buy a policy and it doesn't cover you for anything, basically, right? So you buy this, this policy and it's almost useless, right? You're better off spending the same amount of money uh, into, into a cybersecurity program, but maybe you don't have that or, you know, it's not enough for you. So like, why don't you basically, uh, you know, borrow money from from the insurance provider to improve your uh, security posture. So that that's um, that's that's my advice. Anyway, running out of time. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, ping me on Discord. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is my favorite sentence in Latin. Errare umanum est sed in errare per severare diabolicum. Thanks for listening. And I think I have to stop sharing now and give back to the uh, organizer. Okay. All right. Thanks, Paolo. Uh, we are going to wrap this, this up. up. Uh, do, you do you feel, feel like we're going on? on? Is a uh, microphone off? off about the engine switches on all the panels. So, so thanks, thanks, everyone. Uh, we're uh, we're going to be moving over to the break down. Do you want to continue? Yeah, thank you. Thank you.